just to it. I'm going to share a few things, a few, a, a few ways that God has revealed his love to us. Because sometimes we just take things for granted, right? I think a lot of people do that in their marriages too. And we become lukewarm. The church became very lukewarm because they lost touch with all that God has done through the centuries. All right, so I'm going to try to go through them real quick. First of all, before God ever created the heavens and the earth, he had us in mind. Because we know that the earth is the only place in the universe, in created universe, that fits a human being. So everything God made in the earth, on the earth, under the earth, in the sky, God made with us in mind. It was a gift to us. And the heavens declare the glory of God. So, we had a problem though, you know, because Adam and Eve sinned, rebelled against God, and brought a curse on the earth, and therefore every man and woman was under a curse. So God had to find a way to rescue us from the curse and to bring us back into fellowship, intimate fellowship with him. So what does he do? He finds a man. His name's Abram. He's living in a pagan culture. But God chooses him and points out to him and reveals himself to one man. He reveals himself to one man in a pagan culture. And that man became Abraham, who is the father of our faith. He revealed himself to a man from a pagan culture and pulled him out and made some promises to him. And one of those promises was that he would give him a land that was flowing with milk and honey and his descendants would own it. You know what? I'm not going to go through the whole story of Genesis, the book of Genesis, but we know that through Ab Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob came the nation of Israel. And God chose this nation to reveal himself. If you look at history, biblical history, if you read the Bible from cover to cover in chronological order, it will show you God's plan of the ages that would bring us to the culmination of the ages, which is the wedding feast of the Lamb. This is what he died for. And God has been working through the ages to redeem us for that purpose. Amen? Amen? He called out the Israelites to reveal his character to the rest of the world. Believe me, the whole known world knew about it when, they, when God destroy, destroyed the nation of Egypt, when he brought the, the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. The richest nation in the world was in shambles. It was wrecked. It's as if God took a wrecking ball and just wrecked it to pieces. There wasn't one thing standing. Pharaoh might have still been Pharaoh, but he was Pharaoh over a huge mess. Amen? Okay, he revealed his character of a loving father, patient, long-suffering to the Israelite people, and even his showing even brought salvation to a prostitute who lived in Jericho, who had heard what God had done. Listen, God has been trying to reveal himself to the world. But the Israelites failed him miserably, right? Because they went into rebellion over and over and over and over and over again. They just would not obey God. They would not serve him. They would not love him no matter what he did for them. And so the world's still at this time looking, who is God? What's he really like? So he said, okay, I'm going to send my son to be the sacrificial lamb. So God himself comes out of heaven in the form of a human and takes upon himself human frailty. And he, Jesus said, I came so that you might know the Father. I came. Jesus said, I came so you would know God the Father. You want to know what God the Father is like? The Jewish people were supposed to reveal it, but they didn't obey. He said, I came so you could know what he's really like. Everything you see me do, I only do what I see my father do. And you can see him healing sick people. You can see him healing the blind. You can see him 
uh, delivering people from demonic oppression and, and uh, demonic strongholds. You can see God at work through Jesus. You can see that he has compassion for the poor. That he hates injustice and he hates religion. Hates it. Hates religion. Hates it. So Jesus came and became the sacrificial lamb for our sin to reveal God's love for us. And when he went back to heaven and rose from the dead and went to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit. He poured out his Holy Spirit over the whole of 120 people who were waiting for him. You know, 500 people saw Jesus raise up into heaven. 500 people witnessed Jesus rise up into heaven and heard the angels say, the same way you saw him go up, one day he's coming back. Amen. Hallelujah. 500 people saw it, but 120 were the ones who received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Where were the rest of them? 380 people, right? 380 people. Where were they? I'm, I'm sorry, but if I'd have seen any man go up into heaven and angels talk to me, I don't think anything would have kept me from doing what God said. He said, wait. Wait until you receive the promise of the Father, the power of the Holy Spirit. 380 people went back to their farms, back to their shops, back to their business, back to their schoolwork, back to all their distractions, their iPads, their iPhones, their computers, their televisions, their movies, their sports. They were too busy to be around waiting on the Lord. When the power of the Holy Spirit came, he came in power. Fire fell on the disciples, 120 of them, not just the 12 big shots, but every little shot that was in that room received the same anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The glory of God filled the temple. How do you about that? Do you want to see God fill this temple? Yes. He can do it again. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not a respecter of persons. He's waiting for some people who want him as much as he wants them. Hallelujah. Now, after that, well, since then, he's been preparing a bride. He's been, pre he's been preparing the bride, the church, the people of God for the great wedding feast that he has planned. And now I'm going to tell you, because of that, one thing, each one of us is called to a divine purpose an eternal destiny with him. Throughout history, God has been calling out to us. His heart reaching out in mercy. His arms of mercy calling us to himself. Well, let's talk a little bit about church history. Not much. We know that he poured out the Holy Spirit upon the believers in the first century. In the book of Acts Church, signs and wonders were commonplace. I mean, people who lied to the Holy Spirit when they spoke to Peter dropped dead in the church. I mean, I think that's pretty powerful when you lie to the Holy Spirit and you drop dead because we do it all the time. And nobody's dropping dead from it. The power of God was moving through the church that in spite of all the persecution, stonings, imprisonment, killing people, the church grew. It was powerful. It changed a very corrupt empire. The Roman Empire was brought to its knees because of Christians living like Christians. Living as if the only thing that mattered was eternity. But you know what happened? The church became institutionalized. It became institutionalized and it became powerless and corrupt. And it brought in, ushered in the dark ages where the common man was not allowed to read the Bible in his own language. That only the elite could 
read the Bible. And it was in a dead language. Latin was not used anywhere. And so Satan allowed the institutionalized church, the corrupt institutionalized religious system, to bring spiritual darkness over the whole known world. And yet, in spite of the dark ages, there was always a remnant. Always a few who were seeking God. A few who were like David, who would sit up and look at the heavens and think, there must be a God. And if there is, I want to know him. You see, God heard the cries of the people and brought about the translation of the Bible into the common language and many people died at the stake, killed, murdered for their crime of translating the Bible into English or other known languages like German. And so, but you know what? Their blood, the blood of the martyrs, lit a fire, began to bear fruit and out of that came the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation brought truth to the masses. The truth was you didn't need a religious hierarchy to get to heaven. You did not need to be in bondage to a church system that was built on paganism. The church system was paganism. That God said through the word that we are all priests. If you're a child of God, you're a priest. You don't need a priest to get to heaven. You don't need a priest to go between you and God because you have direct access to him because of what Jesus did. Hallelujah. So the Protestant Reformation brought the church into the revelation that we're saved by grace, by faith in the atoning work of Jesus. That's why we can go into the house of God, into his holy of holies, and hear from him directly. All right? So God brings in the Protestant Reformation, and people get saved. Hallelujah! But you know what? That wasn't enough. God has been restoring the body of Christ back to the Book of Acts church. But every time he brings us to this milestone, like the Protestant Reformation, we dig our heels in. We get a little bit of truth, and we start, oh, a new denomination. Let's plant our flag here. This is what we believe. This is what we teach. And we build up walls. More religious walls. By the way, we keep the pagan system of of religion in it with their hierarchy. Right? And you get the Episcopalian church or the Anglican. And you get the, I mean, Church of England. Then you get the Lutherans. And then you get all the other isms. The Baptists discovered, oh, we need to be water baptized. We need to be, need to be immersed, so let's start a, re- a denomination. That's why they're called the Baptists, because they baptize in water instead of sprinkling. Okay, it goes on and on throughout history. God's people would get a little bit of truth, and they'd plant their flag. This is it. We're not going any further, because this is the revelation God has given us, and anything outside of that must be wrong, because if he didn't give it to me, it can't be right. Religion, denominational walls, barriers to the people, barriers. So the Pentecostal movement comes in. In the early 1900s, a great wave of the Holy Spirit in Wales and on Azusa Street in California, God chose the armpits of the earth to show himself mightily because at least there, there were some people asking for more of God. Because you know how you get for more of God? You, get, you ask him. You got you to get to the place where you say, God, I know this is not all there is. I want all you got. I've given you everything I've got, and I want it all. And you know what? That's the kind of prayer we all need to have. When you think you've reached the end of the road, you're deceived. Because the depths of God's the understanding of God and his ways and his love is bottomless. You cannot get it all. You won't get it all till you see him face to face in heaven. For heaven's sake. Let's go for the gold. Let's go for everything God's got. 
Amen? Amen. All right.